it is a pleasure to be here and uh, uh, present to you uh, uh, some work I've done uh, with a couple of uh, people uh, in my team and in industry on applying uh, uh, a special way of evaluating queries in databases with the low complexity uh, to, the prob to optimization problems, in particular to learning uh, regression models, for instance, classification models and, and the likes. And uh, this is uh, partly pa uh, part of a, of a paper that we had in SIGMOD uh, last year and uh, in pods next year. And uh, Mahmoud Abokamis and Hun Go, they, are, uh, they used to be with LogicBlocks, uh, a company in the US, now they are in a stealth mode. Uh, and uh, Xuan Long Nguyen is a professor of statistics at the um, University of, of, of Michigan. And Max Schleich is, uh, is my student. So uh, the, the overall idea, which I also ex tried to explain yesterday, of uh, factorized databases, which is at the core of this work, is uh, to um, observe that uh, uh, databases, in particular, uh, if, you, if you look at the relations representing uh, results of joints and uh, general queries in databases, uh, tend to be highly redundant. And that redundancy uh, actually hampers uh, scalability a lot, right? And, uh, Essentially, we can actually go without it. That is, we can, in fact, uh, identify that uh, uh, in our data we are going to produce uh, blocks of uh, records which are, in fact, the same. We may represent them once, and we can compute them once. And, and the kind of uh, punchline of the talk is that uh, this uh, compression does not hinder subsequent processing. In particular, we can learn regression models over this um, uh, compact representation. Uh, without uh, effectively uncompressing it. Good. So before I go into the more technical part, let me give you a very brief overview of what's going on in the space of databases at the moment, and uh, in particular with regards to machine learning. Um, uh, obviously, machine learning these days uh, took over the world, right? Uh, most researchers most might want only to work on machine learning, on the cherry on top of the cake, uh, my point is that the cake represents a data management in the sense that you have to somehow get to the data, you have to process these large amounts of data, and eventually you will also have to build the model and then uh, 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 you know, uh, train it on that particular uh, data set. And um, uh, based on this realization, uh, in the database research landscape and also in industry, people looked at building systems that integrate uh, uh, databases and machine learning. And this uh, level of integration actually differs uh, uh, widely. Uh, most systems would go for a no integration approach. What does it mean? It means that the machine learning and the database uh, systems, they are effectively distinct tools in the, in the technology stack. Right? You do whatever operations you have to do in the database, then you export your data outside the database, you import it into your machine learning tool, and then you do something with it. Right? And a lot of time is spent at this interface, in fact. Right? Um, but most systems are in that space these days, right? If you heard of Spark or even Postgres, uh, that there are solutions based on Postgres uh, that couple with the R, the statistical software package, or with the other, other software packages in Python and so on and so forth, right? Um, then there is a next step, which is a loose integration of the two. Here the idea is that you extend the database system with so-called user-defined functions, right? That, and you'll have one such function per uh, particular task, machine learning task. And then you, f you see uh, systems out there such as Matlib, which was developed uh, jointly between industry and academia, where um, you get Postgres, right? And then you get these user-defined uh, aggregate functions uh, for uh, a particular uh, uh, linear regression model for another linear regression model using this implementation, using that implementation that is based on uh, gradient descent or just exact, right? And then you get uh, for logistic regression, you know, you get uh, for uh, generalized linear models and so on and so forth. And they usually list a, a long, they have a long list of things they support. And, you know, every other month they, they come up with a new, uh, with support for, 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 for a new uh, machine learning task. This is, in fact, much better than before in the sense that now you avoid this export-import step, right? Everything is done within the same process, more or less, okay? Um, and the database effectively computes a table, which is a design matrix, 
which is then fed to this user-defined uh, aggregate function, which works on it. Then the next step, which was uh, taken by Bismarck, uh, uh, is to provide the uniform, unified programming architecture. Here the idea is that you have a single framework in which you can program various uh, machine learning tasks, right? You don't have a single user-defined function per uh, 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 task, but rather uh, you basically share the code. So the same code you can reuse here and there, right? It's like, it's like you define new classes, right? This class does this, but then I can use some code I did for that class to use it for another class implementing something else, right? So still the database computes one table and the machine learning works uh, directly on it. Then there is some overhead by for doing this uh, versus just implementing, having a specified, a specific implementation per uh, 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 machine learning task. Uh, but, uh, you know, the kind of claim is that there is an overhead, it's perhaps, uh, you know, 100%, but not more. Uh, and uh, the, the, the final step in this journey is given by a tight integration, and this is what I will call, and I will use in the subsequent part of the talk, as in-database analytics. Here the idea is that you integrate the database in the machine learning task much more, to the point where you get a single evaluation plan for both the machine learning and the whatever query or whatever you know database logic you have to run inside the database. So you merge them together, right? And there are opportunities there. For instance, you may realize that parts of the machine learning task you can actually push past joints in the database, right? And you can sometimes do earlier some of the processing so that you can reduce the amount of data you have to process at subsequent stages. And here there are systems such as Morpheus and also our approach, and they also support various uh, sorts of machine learning tasks. And I will talk about some of them uh, today. Um, and in general, why this in-database analytics approach is appealing? Well, simply because uh, of the realization that instead of moving data, which is large, between the various stages of processing, you better move the code, which may be arguably much smaller, right? And uh, it is also then uh, faster overall because, you know, you don't have to also change formats of the data between the different tools. Then another approach, uh, another important aspect for this is that we exploit database technologies, right? We can exploit uh, well-known uh, indexing techniques, well-known uh, uh, joint processing techniques, right, to solve some of the problems we have there. Then we can also exploit the relational structure. And this is something I will insist in the third part of my talk. Namely, we can exploit the schema of the data. We can exploit the query over which we want to learn. And we can exploit the dependencies that are in the data. And that may actually boost our processing time hugely, as we will see, right? And uh, simply, we can build better models using larger data sets and faster by, by avoiding some of these uh, uh, bottleneck steps. But the second realization, and this is uh, what actually triggered my interest mostly, is that we can be smarter. When, when, when we put together uh, the machine learning task and the, and, the, and the query over which we want to compute, uh, to, to train a model, we can actually find ways to better optimize the two together, more than what we could do individually for each of them, right? In particular, if you stare enough at, uh, let's say, simple, you know, classical, uh, uh, machine learning tasks such as learning a linear regression model, you realize that the data dependent part of it could be factored out and computed inside the database by just simply using joints and aggregates. Not a single aggregate, but very many aggregates, but nevertheless, right? Uh, it can be done. S uh, current systems might not be able to cope very well with this. You know, database systems, where, where when you give them a flurry of, I don't know, some 100,000 aggregates to evaluate at once, because they are not designed for that. But nevertheless, we can extend the database technology that exists out there to cope with this multi-aggregate processing problem. Yeah? And that is the kind of very interesting thing. So to the point where uh, an optimized machine learning and query workload can be processed end-to-end -end much faster than just computing and materializing the join inside the database, in fact. Right? So that's the kind of, uh, uh, I would say, uh, punchline of this. Uh, then obviously we'll still need for some of this uh, 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 sophisticated processing for machine learning um, fixed point computation sometimes, you know, for model convergence and for other, uh, uh, you know, similar uh, tasks, right? Uh, 
But the idea is that if we can somehow factor out the data dependent from the data independent part and do the data dependent using database technology, then that may actually be a winner. So um, schematically, if I were to explain this, would be like this. We have the in database approach, which is in green in the picture, and the out database, which is in red. Uh, in red, what we get is a feature extraction query, essentially a query that goes over the tables and says, I want these uh, features, right? And please merge the tables and bring them together to me, right, from the database. Then I would materialize the result of this feature extraction query, and that will be my design matrix, which I then feed it to an ML tool. And then I will get my parameters of the model. The green part, however, looks longer because it involves much more sophisticated uh, requirements. Um, First, we start with the feature extraction query, but we do not evaluate it just yet. We take the model, we reformulate it in, in a way where we extract these queries that are needed for, for constructing the model, right? These aggregates, right? We merge them with the feature extraction query and we optimize them. And the optimized version only we actually evaluate, we compute. And that would feed into this gradient descent trainer in our setting that would give us uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, some values of aggregates that together with the parameters, we then uh, fit into this uh, convergence step until we actually get a convergence. Yeah. Can I ask if this ML tool and gradient descent trainer is the same? It just runs on different... Uh, yeah, so this is our own gradient descent trainer, whereas the ML tool can do whatever they want to do, right? You sometimes... Uh, cannot know exactly what they do, right? unless, unless you know, perhaps they, they, they specify somewhere. In our case, we had to open up the ML toolbox, right? And look inside the code and, you know, rewrite it somehow. Okay, so we cannot reach back to the ML tool. Here, when you have the optimized run algorithm queries, it cannot just... Uh... No, it, it, can, it cannot just uh, look back to the ML tool. Uh, wait, in our, in our setting. In other settings, it may. If you have, I don't know, uh, 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 Several layers, right, in, in, your, uh, in your learning task, and then perhaps the very basic, the, the base ones would be fed by our approach. And after that, you use the other, uh, uh, for the other layers, uh, an existing ML tool like uh, <laughs> TensorFlow or so on and so forth. Good, so does it pay off in practice? <clears throat> so these are some numbers. Uh, so our approach is actually, we have an, uh, a homemade one, right? Uh, at Oxford, but we also have uh, a prototype implemented at LogiBlox, which has been acquired uh, uh, about a year ago by, by IN4. And, uh, and here is the retailer data set we got, uh, we worked, uh, you know, we, we got basically from, uh, from our industrial partner. Um, if you look uh, at the rightmost column, we have uh, here the full data set, has about 86 million records. And uh, here's some information. In the first part, the top part, we want to learn a linear regression model, um, and I, I will give you some details of that in a second. Then we have about 3,600 uh, 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 features, right, which would be categorical. Some of them are continuous. Uh, then uh, we will generate out of this uh, something in the order of 145,000 aggregates, which you have to compute. Uh, all other approaches using their own techniques uh, uh, wouldn't be able to cope within 24 hours, or they run out of memory. Our approach can do it in 380 seconds, for instance, right? Uh, for the smaller data set, we take an excerpt of 17 million uh, with much, uh, with, with very, very few features. Uh, Madlib would take about 2,000 seconds, uh, out of which uh, NR would take 50 seconds only to compute the join, then to export the join result and import it, take 308 seconds, and then do the learning for 480. We do it in 25 seconds, which is half the time it will take to just compute and materialize the join, right? Okay, and I will show you several aspects of why this is the case, right? One goes back to the, to the main idea that uh, 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 data, the result of a join, right, the way we store it standard, in the standard way in relational databases is highly redundant. And that redundancy is not really necessary there, okay? If we move to higher degree models like polynomial regression degree two, then, <clears throat> Even for the smaller data set, uh, uh, our uh, best uh, competitor uh, cannot cope within 24 hours, right? So here the motivation was clear. We wanted to get it faster. We can then use less Amazon infrastructure, uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 money. 
and then uh, overall uh, uh, it, it gets better. So uh, uh, in, in these fairly s uh, small companies, uh, uh, the, the cost invested in infrastructure to just train models is non-trivial, right? You know, is on, the, on, on a par almost with, with salary costs for all the engineers they have, right? <clears throat> Good, so let me then go deeper into the, the, the more technical part of the talk and talk about what we call factorized learning over normalized data. Then time permitting, I'll look at <clears throat> how we can actually exploit functional dependencies to learn even faster. <clears throat> and then I will show you that the techniques I will first explain the context of linear regression could be extrapolated to more complex models. Um, so, the kind of target we have uh, from a you know industrial uh, uh, setting inspired uh, uh, scenario here, we have uh, uh, typical databases with weekly sales, with promotions and products, right? In the in the retail planning and forecasting applications, then the training data set is the result of a feature extraction query, and uh, then the task is to train a model to predict, for instance, additional demand generated for a product due to promotion. And the training algorithm we use here is the batch gradient descent. I mean, we want to resurrect this because it allows us to, to essentially, well, it fits much better with our setting because we can actually decouple the data dependent from the data independent part of the task, right? And in the data dependent part, we can actually do it once, right? And this corresponds to basically doing the gradient descent for the whole batch at once instead of doing it tuple by tuple. And the ML task we, can, we consider and we can, uh, we can uh, support in this framework so far would be rich linear regression, uh, factorization machines, for instance, uh, logistic regression, and so on. Um, <clears throat> so we start with the database. In this case, the database has tables R1 to R5. R1, for instance, uh, gives information about the stock keeping unit, like a product identifier. Then it says that this is in a store on a particular day, and we sold this amount of units. Then another table will tell us, well, this product has this color which apparently is also very important to determine whether you know, a unit is sold or not. Then the day is in a quarter, uh, the store is in a city, the city is in a country, for instance, right? And then um, if we look at this query, which is expressed here in a data log-like syntax, we can think of it as you know, first order query, you know, conjunctive query, you know, and so on, right? Uh, we have so-called free variables, which are uh, uh, the variables that appear in the head of the query, so in Q over there, Right? And we have the bound variables, which are all the other variables, which essentially appear only in the body of the, of the query, that is in R1 to R5, but not in Q. Right? And among them, we see that some of them are categorical, and wh while others are continuous. For instance, uh, stock keeping unit is an identifier. This is a categorical, a qualitative information. Whereas uh, 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 um, uh, unit sold is a continuous variable. Right? We we'll have to treat categorical and continuous variables differently in our setting because this is the way it is also done standardly in, the, in, in, in machine learning. So I will start with a simple uh, case. We learned the rich linear regression model, which we express like that. So it's, a, it's essentially a dot product of some parameters theta that we want to learn and the features x. The features are effectively in the, in the previous, uh, from previous query, all uh, free variables, right? Uh, which are um, uh, without the, 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 uh, the units sold. And the response would be the units sold. So we want to predict that. So how to obtain the parameters? Well, we can do this by minimizing the objective function. And this is uh, the least square uh, uh, objective function, where uh, effectively what, uh, what it, stays, uh, it's, uh, it, it, it says is this. So we have a database D, and this is our training data set which is in fact the result of our feature extraction query over the input database, right? And we look at every record in there, which we, you know, denote it here by X, the features, and Y, the, the response. And for each of them, we look at the difference between what the function says, our function at the moment says, the model says, this dot product, right? And what we see, the response we, we actually have in that training uh, tuple. And we try to minimize this particular difference, okay? So that's the idea, to minimize this error. And then we have a regularizer, in this case an L2 regularizer, which is there for uh, um, over and under fitting uh, pur uh, purposes, right? So this is what we will work with. 
Now, as you can see here, the way it is expressed logically makes sense. You go over every record, and for each record in the trained data set, you look at minimizing this error. But this particular formulation somehow entangles uh, access to both the, the parameters and the data, the, the, the feature vector x. What we like ideally is to rewrite that so that we can decouple the parameters theta from everything that has to do with the, with the feature vector x. Yeah? Which is a very, very simple rewrite. So um, uh, one side note before we go deeper is um, for the categorical variables, we have actually to consider a one hot encoding usually, right? We cannot just sum over them. We cannot sum over product identifiers. It doesn't make sense, right? So what happens usually is that uh, you, we map them to so-called indicator vectors. For instance, if we have uh, one of the categorical variables, say country, and country would have in our data set two categories, Vietnam and England, then country is mapped to this indicator vector, which is ex effectively um, a vector with two positions, one for Vietnam and one for England. And in a record in the training data set, we either have Vietnam, x Vietnam is uh, one or zero. But in any case, we cannot have both Vietnam and England one, for instance, or both zero. So one of them must be one, but only one of them, right? And uh, then uh, uh, the indicator vector for country could look like that. You know, it, is, uh, it has two positions and will correspond to country England in our case because Vietnam is first, yeah? So this encoding obviously leads to wide training data sets because effectively we take all the distinct values in the column and we make them uh, uh, features. We make them at the same level with the, with the variables in our query. And that becomes less of a database problem where the schema somehow is fixed, right, and small. But the data can be large. So that poses one of the problems. So we have to somehow uh, get around this. And the, the, the second issue is that if we do it plainly like that, we'll have a lot of zeros, right? Because, you know, in a, in a, imagine you have a, a 20 uh, uh, categories for a variable and only one bit is set to one, all others are zero, then you have all the time in every record to train code that, right? Good. So um, now let's see how we can, so we go back to the previous slide uh, where we uh, had this uh, <coughs> uh, objective function and we try to rewrite it. So uh, first we have to understand what exactly we want to achieve. So we'd like to compute this parameters theta, which would minimize our loss function, j. Yeah? And how can we do this? For instance, we, we can update repeatedly our theta in the direction of the gradient until convergence. And that's the formula where this uh, 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 is, is, the, is, the, is the sign for the, for the uh, de uh, derivative. So what do we actually do? Yes? Yeah, so the alpha, right, the alpha here is the, is the learning rate, right, the step size, it's called, right? So it is a parameter which, you know, there, there is a lot of theory here which, you know, comes from, uh, you know, statistics, machine learning uh, uh, community, where uh, you can adjust it as you go along, right? You can start with a larger one, so you can make bigger jumps, but as you get closer to convergence, you might want to reduce it, otherwise you might miss your uh, 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 optimum, right? So <coughs> Yeah, it will apply to our setting effectively, right? Because in order to set uh, alpha, for instance, using the line search and our Michel conditions or so on, right? You would uh, effectively want to evaluate your function in different points, right? And for that, you would actually use uh, our, our frame. So the idea is this. Um, <clears throat> uh, we, we effectively, um, if, if we start with our uh, 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 loss function, we, may, we are able to rewrite it in this form, and I will explain it in a second, right? So this form effectively has theta separated from a sigma matrix, which refers to our uh, feature vectors, right? And similarly here, we have a dot product of theta with some vector C, which depends on the features. And here we have another parameter, which is scalar SY, which just refers to the response. So how is this set, uh, sigma defined, for instance? Sigma, uh, an entry in sigma is in fact a product of the features xi and xj, right? 
And we do this product for every record in our uh, 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 table, in our uh, uh, input uh, training uh, data set, okay? So that is it. So we are able to, you know, it's, it's a very easy uh, uh, re uh, reformulation, in fact, right? And this xi, xj uh, could be the scalars in case we, uh, you know, they correspond to continuous variables or could be indicator vectors in case they, they correspond to categorical variables, right? In case of C, this is just a vector because we effectively multiply every feature by its, uh, uh, by, by, by the response, which is a scalar. And S, Y is just uh, uh, the response squared, right? So that is the, the reformulation we do in this, uh, in this form. So now if we want to evaluate that particular uh, loss function, if we compute beforehand sigma C and S, Y, we can then uh, uh, just plug it in. Is the, the, the only time we have to touch the data, a part of that everything is just uh, in this space with the uh, you know, converging theta. But more interestingly, also if we take the, 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 the derivative, so if you want to compute the gradients of this uh, loss function, we can maintain the separation of the thetas from the data dependent part, right? And, uh, and, and this is uh, 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 not, not stated here, but, but you know, I, can, I can do it offline. So, um, uh, and these sigmas, as you, if, if, you, if you look at them closely enough, you realize that they are just aggregates, okay? So uh, we can express them in you know, first order, we can exp uh, 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 as, as a first order query, or you know, here, give it in SQL. Um, so in case xi and xj are continuous, Right? We can actually do the product of them, right? so they are scalars. The, the query becomes just that, to solve that particular uh, entry in the matrix. is the sum of the product of xi and xj, where d here is the natural join of the tables r1 to r5 with some projections, possibly. Okay? Um, then, in case, for instance, uh, xi is categorical, yeah, we cannot sum over it, but what we can do, however, is to consider it of value one, but then we record for every single distinct xi value, right, what is the, the, uh, the sum of, of xj's, right? It is as if here we multiply xj with one all the time because xi is categorical, so its value is one, and we just uh, effectively report for every xi distinct value, right, distinct category of xi, we report the sum over xj. And then we group by this, okay? And that's the query we have to do, effectively. Um, why is this better than the one hot encoding? Because in, with this query, we only ever get back uh, 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 categories that actually exist in the data. We never get zeros anywhere, right? And in the, in the ultimate case where we have both uh, 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 variables categorical, we group by them. By, 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 uh, by both of them, by xi and xj, and we just do a count. We sum one for every single uh, uh, combination of them, right? So for every distinct combination, look how many times that distinct combination appears, and that's it, right? So instead of actually in the, in the one hot encoding case, we'd have perhaps xi with one zero 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 and the other one one zero zero zero, and it's just appearing, you know, we just meant to say that, I don't know, the country is uh, uh, England and the, and the city is London. Right, and with a lot of zeros. Here we don't. We only consider combinations of these uh, xi and xj's that in fact occur in the data, right? And they become queries. But the issue is we get very many of them, right? And how to evaluate them? Some of them, right? So this encoding avoids the drawback of one hot encoding, as we discussed already. But the trouble here is that some of these queries are, you know, would return a scalar, some of them return tables. How can we evaluate all of them together? is the question, right? So how to compute them efficiently? So I'll just give you an example to highlight how we can do query uh, aggregates over joins, right? Um, but there, there is a lot of interesting theory here uh, of how to evaluate uh, optimally these, these sort of queries. Let me put it uh, with the star, the optimally. Optimally means with the, with the best uh, complexity we know so far, right? which we actually uh, uh, investigated uh, about four years ago, but there is follow-up work on that uh, uh, in the framework of so-called functional aggregate queries by Hung Ngo and others, uh, for instance, which was, has been uh, also invited at various venues in the theory community. Um, so 
<clears throat> I will give you an example, a very simple example. Imagine you have the following tables. Orders, dish, and items. And um, what we, in orders, we have customers that order certain dishes on certain days. The dish would have certain uh, items as components, and then an item will have a, a price. Okay? And we want to learn something over it. We want to, uh, uh, let's say, you know, join all of them, and we like to, well, in this case, perhaps it's a bit uh, harder to predict anything, right? But imagine, you know, it, it is a toy example, right? We want to do the join, and imagine that they are all features, and we want to compute these sort of uh, aggregates I mentioned to you before. Right? So if we do the natural join query of this, what is the, uh, the, the actual uh, uh, semantics of a join? You look at the uh, uh, common columns, uh, co uh, columns with a common name, dish in this case for the first two tables, orders and dish, and item for the last two tables, dish and items, okay? And whenever tuples from the distinct uh, 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 tables uh, uh, agree on the value, you will create a tuple in the result. In particular, we see that um, uh, um, we have a burger twice uh, in the first table, right? And burger appears uh, three times in the second table. And uh, this means that if we do a join of orders and dish for the dish burger, we'll get six combinations. Two from a table and three from the other table. So we have effectively for burger a Cartesian product of the, ta of the tuples from a table, tuples from the other table that agree on this value uh, burger. And this is what I actually depict here, right? Now, it is easy to see that this actually entails lots of redundancy. First of all, this burger occurs very many times. Then Alice occurs very many times. Monday is copied over and over again. Why? Because the first tuple uh, in the first uh, table occurs as many times as burger values we have in the second table. Right? So it's copied over and over again. This listing representation, in fact, is at the core of standard relational processing these days and nevertheless hinders scalability. And it's amazing that, uh, you know, it is still going on, right? I can understand, however, that the relational representation is actually very amenable to simple implementation in practice, right? But it does hinder a lot uh, 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 the, the, the scalability, and this is what we actually seek to avoid here. So how can we actually compress this thing? Uh, one way to compress it is um, to just look at it as as if it is an alge uh, algebraic expression, right? Where we use a, a product, we use union, right, from relational algebra, and values, which in this case could stand for, you know, simple relations, right, with one column and one value, okay? So then a tuple is just a product of this sort of singleton relations, and different uh, tuples in the result would correspond to a union of such products, okay? Now if you have this, armed with uh, the laws of, uh, of, uh, of, of this algebra, right, such as the, the, the distributivity of product over union, we can start factoring out, things, right? And there are very many ways of factoring out, and of, obviously a natural challenge is which one would be best, right? But let's see first one of them. This is one of them. This one says the following, you know, if you look at the left, you see um, my factorization structure, which tells me the following, it says, I look first at the dish, and then for every dish, I look at days and customer, and I also look at item and price. Now, what does this factorization do in this case? It exploits the conditional independence, which is in the data, right? Given a dish, day and customer are independent of item and price, right? This is quite natural, right, to exploit this. And this is enforced to us by the join. The join semantics tells us that this is the way you should do it, right? You should pair for every dish the days and customer with item and price. But here, instead of eagerly materializing these combinations, we in fact represent them more symbolically. We just say, yes, for a given burger, we have a product of information we, come, we get from a table about day and customer and information we get about items and price from the other table. We just refrain from materializing this Cartesian product. The implications can be staggering. I mean, there are queries for which, uh, uh, you know, the complexity, for instance, could be exponential, right, in the number of, uh, of uh, 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 relations in the, in the query, whereas we stay linear at most in the size of the data. Perfect. Yeah? Okay. 
So um, you are right. <laughs> Yay, several times. Um, <clears throat> that the variable order drastically influences the compression factor you can get, right? And, 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 and one major challenge is uh, deciding, you know, finding out which variable orders would be best. That is, will give us the lowest uh, uh, representation size, okay? And here is not only about lowest representation size. It is also about how fast you can compute it because given the input data and the query, you may as well compute directly this representation and not go over the flat, you know, listing representation and then compress it, right? And it turns out that uh, if we uh, only resume ourselves to um, uh, uh, factorization structures which, ex which effectively are defined by the conditional independence in the queries, right, then uh, we can find the worst case optimal ones, right? That is, uh, we actually show that, uh, uh, that they have a certain size, right, regardless of the database, and this is necessarily so. There are infinitely many databases, input databases, for which the size has to be of that uh, form, right? And what would be that form? What would be the parameter that actually governs, you know, all this? Well, this is uh, nothing more than the so-called fractional hypertree width, which is a measure used in across computer science to define tractability of problems, right? In logic, in, uh, 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 for inference in graphical models, in probabilistic graphical models, for instance, these days, it is in uh, matrix chain uh, multiplication. Now we did it also in databases, in fact, right? So we showed effectively that uh, that is the, 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 the best measure, uh, measure you can actually hope to get at the moment. It is true that in the meantime, people look deeper, and if you exploit the data as well, some patterns in the data, in particular so-called bounded degree information in the data, sometimes you can be more adaptive. Imagine the following. Imagine that under dish, under a particular dish, you may want to have day and customer in this order, but under a different order, uh, under a different dish, you may want to have customer day order and not day customer, because the data tells you so. And then you can get a much lower uh, 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 complexity, and that is governed by another uh, with measure, which is called some modular width, in fact, right? That case you would win, like, just a little bit, like... Yeah, you just, uh, yeah, in this case, you don't win asymptotically. But there are cases in which you can win asymptotically. And by this, I really mean the, the exponent of the complexity can actually, you know, uh, be arbitrarily uh, better, right? But one important thing here is that, you know, this fractional hypertree width is a very nice measure, actually. And you, the people extended it also to take into consideration cardinality constraints, <laughs> bounded degree constraints, and so on, right? So it can be an effective cost measure to be included in a query optimizer, in fact, right? And we do just that. Um, <clears throat> and not only that, we actually can, can define what it means for a representation to be of worst case optimal size, but we can also have algorithms to compute it in worst case optimally, modulo log factor. Right? That is, given the input database and the query, you can compute directly this representation, which, according to our cost measure, would be the best. Unless you look at the data, and you may find additional patterns in the data which you can exploit. Good. So uh, now with further compression, there is something else we can do here. What? Well, <clears throat> that particular tree structure told us something about some in the conditional independence, namely that given dish, the left branch is independent of the right branch. Right? But there is more to it. Given item, dish and price are independent, right? Because this is what the initial table, uh, the, you know, the, the, the second join told us, right? Uh, item and price would be in a, in a table, and dish and item in another table, right? It doesn't matter. I mean, there may be several dishes using the same item, but the item will still come with the same price, at least in our data set, okay? So what does it mean for us? It means that effectively, we can share the price for the various items, regardless whether they come under burger or hot dog. Now here, the, the saving is modest, right? It's just you save a value, right, a constant, right? But um, in practice, imagine that instead of the value two here, you may have an entire subtree, which may be very large, and you can save it. In fact, the difference between not sharing and sharing can be um, uh, in the exponent a logarithm in the number of relations, which may be huge. You have a large query, right? You know, a path, a path of length n, 
In one case, you get uh, a complexity which is linear size in the size of the input database, uh, the linear time. In the other case, you get something which is d to the power of log n, where n is the number of relations, right? So it can be uh, uh, huge. So <clears throat> now, the same data, but different factorization. Now we decided to say, uh, well, let's, let us group by day and then customer dish item price. It's just a path. There is no branching. There is no explicit conditional independence now exploited. So this is just a try representation of our result. There is no asymptotic saving over just a listing representation of it. But now, once we start exploiting the conditional independence and we do the sharing, then we get to get linear, right? Here we realize that uh, 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 burgers have the same uh, you know, items regardless who ordered them. And then, well, in this simplistic uh, data set, and similarly, the items have the same prices regardless of the, of the dishes, right, as we had before. So we exploit again the very same conditional independence uh, we have in the data. Good. Can we do, how, how can we actually compute these uh, uh, factorizations? I will just give you a very, very brief uh, 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 idea. Um, imagine we start with that factorization we had, that, that factorization structure, where we had dish, and given dish, we had day, customer, and item price. Okay? What do we do? Well, at the dish, we look at the relations that actually refer to the dish. And we intersect them on that column, which is dish. Right? And then we descend. And then we simply have a lookup in the orders table for the given dish we fixed above to get the days. And for each day and each dish, we then have a lookup to get the customers. Similarly, on the other branch, given the dish, we can then have a lookup in the, in the dish tables uh, table to get the items, and for each item we can then get the price. So that's the way uh, we could do it. There is one important thing we should uh, know, namely that, first of all, our relation should be sorted following a topological order of our, uh, of our uh, variable order. Why that? Uh, so that uh, we can actually support the intersections in the order we encounter them top down. And the second thing is, these intersections have to be done somehow efficiently. Right? That is, given two lists which are sorted in the same order, then the intersection should take time which is proportional to the size of the minimum list, to the minimal of, of the two. Right? So that is important. Here, the joints are somehow binary, but in general, you may imagine that we have to intersect several relations, several lists at the same time. And this is also very important, to do several lists at the same time. Because if you have, for instance, two very long lists and a very small list, if you just intersect the first two, you already lose. You have to intersect all three of them so you can get the minimum of the three. Okay? And that's, and that's about it. So that's the kind of you know, high level idea of how to do this. Um, how can we do aggregates? So to go back to our uh, learning thing. Well, let us look back at our factorization and imagine you want to do count star. This essentially says how many tuples do I have in the result of the join? Right? How can I do this? Well, it's very easy. I just map all the values to value 1. And I map the union to a plus and the Cartesian product to multiplication. And then, in one bottom-up pass, I compute the values. So here is a 1. I have a single value. And then uh, here is 1, 1, 1. I do a plus. This is 3. I do 2 on the other side. 3 times 2 is 6, and so on. This is specifically what my daughter learns these days in year 7 which is called factorization of algebraic expressions, right? She learns how to do exactly this, right? Instead of doing 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3,000 times, you can do 3 times 1,000. But this 1,000 may not necessarily be just, uh, you know, I mean, it could be also an algebraic expression, a plus b plus 3 uh, plus, plus c, and so on and so forth, right? This is exactly what we do. And this is where we actually save a lot, yeah? So what about doing a, a more complicated uh, 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 aggregate? For instance, we want to sum the product of dish and price. Okay? Now, it's a bit tricky. The price is actually a continuous variable, so we can sum over it, but the dish is actually categorical, right? So we'll have somehow to map it, right, to our uh, 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 indicator somehow, to say that we'll have to keep the dish distinct values and only consider their value as being uh, one somehow for all these summations. So this is what we do. We assume there is a function f that turns dish into reals, in our case, to 0 and 1, right? And 
All values except for addition price will be set to 1, and the union and product are kept as before. We go up, and that's it, you know? We compute the counts as we did before. Now, the values of price are stay in there, right? They are not, uh, 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 you know, uh, replaced by 1 because we want to sum over them. But once we encounter the burger, we apply the function f of burger, which effectively this function, if you think about it, would give me back a hash map, right? A, another function which maps the distinct values of burger to one, or to the how many times a burger appears, effectively, right? And then at the very top, I have a plus between uh, on you know 20, uh, 20 times the the function of burger plus 16 times the function of hot dog. So it would be like you know you have two hash maps and then you have to somehow union them. Right? And that's it. Now, there is a very important aspect I want to emphasize at this stage. I talked about these representations and I showed you that you, know, you can store them like this. You know, we talked about sizes and so on. But in reality, we do not really need to materialize them. You look at them like this and you think better of traces of your computation. This is the way you compute. It, is, it doesn't mean you have to materialize anything and then compute. Right? Okay? Good, so now let me go back to our learning. I hope you, by, by now you understood how we can do this factorized uh, uh, aggregate computation and joint computation. Now we can look at whether we can exploit even more structure from the relational setting, right, for our, uh, for our purpose, namely to learn efficiently uh, uh, regression models. And uh, um, for that, I will take a very simple functional dependency. You no, know? city implies country. Right? So if we are, well, in reality, I know it doesn't hold. There are so many Oxfords and Londons all over the world, in particular in the US, London, right? And Paris and, you know, all possible cities. But in our setting, assume that this holds, right? Um, and uh, we have the following uh, categories for country, Vietnam and England. And for city, we have Saigon, Hanoi, Oxford, Leeds, and Bristol. Yeah? Now, the one hot encoding would enforce the following identities at the level of our uh, uh, um, uh, variables and indicator vectors, right? First of all, Vietnam, x Vietnam should be x Saigon plus x Hanoi. What does it mean? It means that the value we give to this variable, to this feature, Vietnam, right, is one precisely when Saig Saigon or Hanoi are one. But there is more to it, exactly one of them can be one, right? So um, in particular, x Vietnam is one either uh, it means either Saigon is one or Hanoi is one, and similarly for, for England, right? Could be either Oxford or Leeds or Bristol, okay? And um, so we have these identities to start with, which are given to us by our way of reasoning about categorical variables. And um, then we realize that we can actually encode the indicator vector for country as a function of the indicator vector for the city. That is given a city, you know, as the functional dependency says, we can determine the country. So here is what we do. We put this matrix in here, R, which pairs you know, the cities, which are at the top, with the countries, which are vertical. Yeah? And then, um, if for instance, we have a city which is Saigon, which is represented like this, right? then we can determine the country of Saigon by just taking a product of the matrix R with the city uh, indicator uh, vector and then we get it back. How does this help us? This somehow already suggests that we might be able to replace uniformly the feature vector for country with a function of the feature vector for city. So we re-parameterize the model so that we don't talk anymore about country. We only talk about city, okay? This is what we do. So if we start with our function, which is the model we want to learn, which is the dot product of the tetas with the, with the indicator vectors, x, right? And we single out the one for country and the city. Now, we, we know that x country, the indicator vector for country, can be expressed in, as a function of the one for the city. And then we go further, and then we can actually uh, uh, combine the, the, the two here, right? By effectively referring only to the city and having here a new parameter which you call gamma city, which is uh, expressed by using theta country and theta city. So at the level of this loss function, we already reduced the space of the parameters. And we can do this massively. All functionally determined feature vectors 
you know, for all of them, we can take their parameters and remove from the equation. We can then compute the simpler model, and then we can extrapolate it back to the original model. Because we have the mapping, R, which tells us how to do that, right? And that is massive. So in practice, we realize that this actually, you know, helps a lot. Because the kind of data sets we've seen a, uh, have a lot of functional dependencies. Yeah. Is it the same as if you throw away the burger table and just say, if you order the bun, the patty and the onion? In that case, uh, in that case uh, we don't have a functional dependency there. Because I chose it so. But in other settings, you can imagine that, for instance, uh, the, the stock keeping unit, right, the product ID with the date and the store may determine everything else, right? So you may just want to look at the model that, uh, for, for, for those features, and then you map it back to the original one, because obviously users would like to give you the colors and all the other things, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll get the same because you see here, we have an equality between X country and this, right? And here again, we have an equality between the new parameter gamma city and the relationship to country and city. Okay. So we can map it back. But it's not that you just remove the, 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 the row. You no. modify the row in a way that it's... Yeah, we, we simply dis disregard when, when, when we want to compute the aggregates I mentioned to you before, we simply don't look at the aggregates uh, uh, with, with features country. We learn over the other guys. Okay? So uh, what about the penalty term in the loss function is now a question, right? Well, this is actually harder because this is a quadratic uh, uh, formula, right? So if you look here, you see this theta square, right? The, the L2 norm. So uh, it involves a bit more uh, uh, work. Uh, to realize that, uh, well, we, we, we can first, you know, single out the part for, uh, for the country and, uh, uh, well, for the city and the one for the country. And then we can optimize out the country, the parameter for the country, by expressing it in terms of uh, gamma city. How can we do that? We take the, 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 the first derivative, right, with respect to theta country, and then we equate this to zero. And then uh, we put it back and we get something like that. So this is R, our, our mapping matrix. This I city is the identity matrix, uh, uh, which, is, uh, which is as large as you know, the distinct cities we can have in the, in the, in the table. And then uh, uh, gamma, uh, gamma city is the, is the one we actually introduced before, right? So now the penalty terms become something like that. Again, here, we took away the uh, dependency on theta country, okay? So that was another thing we actually had to do. It is much more involved if you want to do this for, for, uh, for nonlinear models, like for factorization machines, for instance. But, but we, 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 we managed to do it, at least for, for degree two. Good. So that was a, uh, the, the, the part on functional dependencies, right? So the idea, again, is you use the functional dependencies to then guide your processing for a smaller model. You learn it, and then you map it back by using the functional dependencies, right? You assume that you know the functional dependencies. You're not yeah. trying to figure them out. No, we, we are not trying to figure them out. There is uh, orthogonal work on uh, ex, you know, inferring functional dependencies, joint dependencies, and other types of dependencies from the data. Right? And would this pay off, actually? In, like, let's try to find functional dependencies, and then once we found them, then, or some of them, then we it would, it would pay off. We, we don't do that, right, because we know. Because, you know, I mean, the data set is given to us. We model it. We know it, right? Uh, uh, you know, at least at the schema level, we know it. So we know what's going on in the data. We also need that as part of, you know, understanding which features we need, which features are relevant for what we want to do. So it is part of that step, of the engineering step. Okay. And I will just conclude very briefly with a general problem formulation, right? So we did just linear regression. Uh, with a uh, rich linear regression, but in general, you can think of having a, a different loss function, L. You can think of having not only just the dot product of the parameters theta with the, with the features x, but rather you may have functions over them that actually could give you polynomial regression, factorization machines, uh, and many, many other things. And the regularizers could be something else, right? We, we don't know yet how to do this 
I mean, exactly, you know, the functional dependency trick, for instance, uh, or, or uh, learning, uh, you know, the complexity for learning for all these possible settings, but at least we investigated some. Our uh, 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 essentially message here is that this formulation allows us to actually express so many things, right? And, um, and for factorization machines, at least, and polynomial regression model, everything I talked about holds, right? So we already know how to do it, yeah? Um, right, so um, uh, to give you, uh, uh, again, uh, uh, to, 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 to remind you, if the, if the uh, 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 well, we, we use co uh, square loss, we use L2 re regularization, the data points are just, you know, the, the, the features we see and the, and the label Y, and then we have just n plus one parameters, you know, also theta zero for the intercept, and uh, then we get back our uh, uh, ob objective function. If you, for instance, would like a polynomial regression, then uh, uh, you start with the same uh, uh, feature uh, vector x, but now the parameters, we get many more parameters, okay? Because obviously we would look not only at, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, theta zero, theta one to theta n, but also theta ij, right? And theta i, you know, for every subset, you know, uh, uh, of, uh, of indices that uh, together would make up uh, uh, degree d, okay? And um, then the features for the different parameters may also matter. Right, they depend on the, on the degree of that uh, particular parameter, and they are then a product of the features to different powers, right? So that the summation of the powers gives you back uh, 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 d, at most d. Can you explain how to do the product of d times <coughs> i oh, sorry. times, times xj, mm -hmm. and how bad does it get if you want to do a product of d between two features? Yeah, I mean, the complexity obviously uh, becomes worse. Because effectively what happens is um, it is as if uh, 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 you create uh, correlations, dependencies between the, the features that actually have in the same product in a way, right? You may, you may do that. It's not, it's not because of the, of the product of these features per se, but it's about the parameter which comes along with them, right? Because you have to multiply a particular parameter, let's say i, j, k, theta i, j, k, with a particular combination of x, i, x, j, x, k, right? And that actually can, uh, but in general, I, I, well, the experience I got from my industrial partners is that they don't really look at uh, uh, models beyond the degree two, right? Or sometimes what they do, they want a specific uh, uh, term with, with a higher degree, but not all terms with a higher degree. Yeah? Factorization machines, they do use sometimes uh, the degree two, okay? But, uh, you know, similarly, you know, you can get factorization machines where now, what, 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 what does it mean, factorization in this setting? It means that you do not factorize the data, but you factorize the parameters, right? So the parameters themselves, if you look at these parameters, right, they are factorized. Instead of having a parameter theta i, theta, j, theta i, j together, the theta i, j is in fact a dot product of theta i's with theta j's, right? So L of theta i's with L of theta j's. Okay, and... Um, we also have, uh, you know, we can do classifiers and so on. So I will finish with this, uh, 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 you know, uh, more um, elaborated picture of what's going on in our uh, in database setting. Namely, we get the feature extraction query, which is usually a join, a, not, a natural uh, a join query. We then get uh, the, from the model the reformulation in these aggregates. We then put them together, the feature extraction query with the with these aggregates and construct all these entries in our sigma matrix, which are aggregates over joints. Um, and that we optimize. How do you optimize? Similarly to what we discussed with these variable orders, or alternatively, we look at hyper decompositions of these queries, and we try to get those that have minimal width, right? And, uh, uh, and that is what we get. And uh, sometimes, you know, this parameter FAQ width, which is uh, like fractional hyper -tree width, but for queries that also have free variables, that is group by variables, right? Uh, this cost here may be much, much less than just uh, 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 doing uh, uh, effectively, you know, a materialization of the, of the joint result, yeah? So that's the whole idea, and this is uh, why I would say uh, uh, our approach can, can outperform uh, uh, the, the state of the art. But once these queries are, are optimized, we obviously evaluate them, right? And then we put them back into this uh, 
uh, uh, fixed point computation uh, until we get uh, convergence. And for this, this is actually something we looked up in the literature and we learned what other people did and how, you know, how to effectively you know, limit the number of uh, convergence steps. Uh, uh, and, uh, and whereas initially we started with something like 10,000 for our settings, now we have a few hundred, right? So there is a huge amount of uh, interesting work done, done in that space, which is not a database uh, uh, work. Okay, so thank you very much. <laughs>